Live the Experience Discussion of PBS with Alexis Quinn, Alicia Wood and Julie Newcomb. Uh, my name is Alexis Quinn and uh, I'm really glad to be here today with um, Julie Newcomb and Alicia Wood and we're going to be talking about um, some of our thoughts about positive behavioural support. Um, Julie, do you want to introduce yourself and say what your relationship is to PBS? Yeah, hi, I'm Julie Newcomb. Um, my son Jamie is autistic and has learning disabilities. Um, over the course of his life, he's lived in quite a few different um, uh, placements, hospitals, homes, schools, whatever. Um, so he's been subject to quite a lot of different PBS programmes. Thanks, Julie. Alicia? I've worked with uh, care providers for many, many years um, who do PBS and, and some of those care providers um, are really good and, and, and support people very well. Some of them aren't very good and um, some of them that I know refuse to use PBS um, because they don't see any benefit in it. Thanks, Alicia. Um, and for those of you that don't know, I was subject to um, PBS in a couple of hospitals, um, which I was in when I was detained under the Mental Health Act as an autistic person. So maybe we can just talk about, I suppose, uh, what, our, what our concerns are. Uh, Julie, I don't know if you want to kick us off. Sure, yeah. Um, well, as I said, Jamie's been, been sort of, you know, uh, on the receiving end of several different PBS programmes from several different providers, and then that includes sort of hospital providers as well as, as community providers. And it's never worked. It hasn't worked. And, and even with really good people doing it, um, uh, it, it hasn't made any difference to his life whatsoever. So I think we've probably wasted an awful lot of time using these programmes to no avail. But that, for me, that's, you know, from a personal perspective, um, it just hasn't worked. In, in terms of um, wider views about why that might be, um, I think it probably looks far too much at a person's behaviour and doesn't look at the person. Um, so we're just seeing um, an individual, a complex, you know, individual, and I mean complex in the widest term there, because we, you know, as humans, we're all we're all pretty complex. Um, it, and, it, and it's just taking one aspect of that person and looking at it in isolation and saying, this is, this is what they're doing and we don't like it, so we're going to stop it. And I think that's such a narrow view, <clears throat> not to be looking at, at the individual as a whole and not to be looking at the history and what might be leading up to um, why that person is, is, is doing what they're doing, that somebody else has decided they want to stop. So I think in, it's so limited in that respect. I don't see how it can ever be um, ever be truly effective uh, in the long term. Um, I, I worry that it doesn't consider the hidden effects of its use, uh, whether or not, you know, for example, forcing an autistic person to mask in order to um, have a behaviour that society deems acceptable isn't um, just isn't right. It, it isn't it isn't rights respecting in any way. Um, there's a power imbalance. So we've got people deciding what somebody else needs to do and trying to make them do it. I think we need to have so much more relational working with people where we're working together um, in understanding somebody and, um, and and seeing them for what they are and who they are. Julie, when, so when you were saying, sorry, when you were saying it doesn't work, what do you, what, 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 were, what were they saying the outcome should be or what, what were you expecting the outcome to be for Jamie? Changing a behaviour that was deemed to be socially unacceptable. unacceptable. So, um, and it didn't work. It didn't work, it didn't change a, any behaviour. Um, and there were times when people were trying to, you know, support him better to, um, to, um, to, to feel better, to be less anxious through a PBS programme, but it didn't work. It wasn't addressing the anxiety. It was, it was, it was addressing how that anxiety was manifesting itself. And I think there's a big difference there in terms of what you're trying to do to help somebody. Because so, so much of my behaviour, certainly, of my challenging behaviour, was actually an externalisation of internal feelings. But exactly. You know, so it was actually, I think you, were, you, you came onto that later, so it just actually makes it worse. Yeah, I think so. And, and, and saying that somebody can be more anxious. Fixed, it makes you a lot more anxious because, you know, you're on sort of very shaky ground here. You, you're getting, you know that somebody doesn't like what you're doing, uh, but you feel you need to do it. So 
Well, it's is, like conditions it, of worth, right? So like you're only is, worthwhile yeah. if you behave like this. Yeah. And because it that's is. not natural to you, it actually makes you more more anxious and, more anxious, and, yeah. and feel much more poorly about yourself because you I can't think. meet these conditions which people deem to be worthwhile. Absolutely. And it's saying somebody can be fixed, which means, therefore, if you're saying you, you, can, you can be fixed, Alexis, you can be fixed. The hidden thing there is you're not really good as, as it stands. You're not looking good as you are. You're not, you know, you're not worthy. You're not enough. You need to be fixed. Mm -hmm. um, and I think um, we need to be looking at it in such a wider way um, than we are doing, because people, maybe just people need to be different. And people are different in lots of ways, and we don't think, well, we need to go and fix them. <laughs> you know, we, we, we seem to have honed in on sort of learning disabilities and autism as something that needs to be fixed. Do you know, what, the best thing for me was like when, um, when um, I had uh, what was described as like challenging behaviour, it, it actually, you know, when I was anxious, obviously it was like made a lot, a lot worse. And I think, you know, a lot of PBS people, when, when they were doing the PBS plans, were mostly looking at that behaviour, um, which was deemed to be sort of dangerous or socially um, unacceptable. Um, do you have sort of any example of like of that with Jamie or Alicia jump in as well if you want to you know because obviously some behavior you know is is dangerous and I think that's what PBS practitioners would be saying oh you know that that's that's what we're looking at you know that's what we're trying to address we're not trying to fix you that's that's what he used to say to me we're not trying to fix you we're trying to fix your behavior <laughs> yeah well that's the problem isn't it I mean it's a bit probably a bit private for Jamie to be saying you know on a on a video but about him and what what <laughs> apparently needed to be fixed um but there are certainly other ways of going about working with somebody and um and supporting them to feel better about themselves and 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 look I think look more at the history this is mm. for me PBS is very narrow we're looking at this here and now this we want to change this this right here and maybe we need to be looking at the history behind it all and we need to be considering the long-term effects as well rather than just looking in isolation at one part of one person no absolutely i think you know if i if i look back you know 20 or even 15 years ago um i was part of um the valuing people movement and and what we talked about then was person-centered approaches and about really listening to people and what they wanted. And, and we, we started to see, um, which I didn't see an issue with it, if I'm honest, at the time um, with PBS coming in as part of a way to support people that organisations really struggle to support. So, you know, it, and I think, you know, I always viewed it, I always viewed it um, as a, when it was talked about the positive behaviour support, it was that the organisation and the support workers were pos being positive about things you know so that's how I always viewed it very um narrowly like that and and um and I think probably what's what's really alarmed me about it is that positive behaviors poor PBS everyone calls it PBS as well you know it's a, there's a whole sort of lingo around it but that that has kind of replaced the person-centered approaches policy and it's and and even more frightening is that there are commissioners saying um, we are only going to commission you if you do positive behavioural support. You've got the regulator, CQC, regulating for positive behavioural support. And I mean, I think that it's one of those things. So some of the good organisations that I saw do it were were really good at listening to people and build relationships. And, and I saw many examples where they weren't fundamentally trying to change someone, but they called it positive behavioural support. I, I would say there was a lot of really sort of gentle teaching methods in there with people and, and just trying being creative around support. But it was all kind of framed under positive behavioural support. And I've seen organisations um, who are applying positive behavioural support, for example, in, in restricted environments in hospitals, where the environment is completely wrong for the person. So what they're doing is trying to get this person to conform to this environment. 
and the the environment is like a form of torture so so this this abuse is is you know under the name of positive behavioral support is is really sort of endemic in those kind of organizations where they're trying to make people fit into some sort of institution be that shared housing residential care or whatever there's there's a you know trying to make someone fit into some something like that doesn't fit so that's a kind of added human rights abuse if you like and and then i think that what i see also is organizations who have got the most appalling cultures that do not understand person centered approaches who that that simply um, don't know how to support people well don't understand don't know don't have the culture who are training people in positive behavioral support methods and and using that and and they it, it, it's it's a a kind of like sticking plaster over the, their their organizational deficiencies and so this kind of notion that you um, as an organization need to change the person to fit in with what you do instead of you as an organization changing your behavior is ridiculous because actually that's what we're seeing so we, we see that that um, the the uh, the Winterbourne View program that transforming care didn't work because organizations don't change their behavior so I think if we're going to talk about positive behavioural support, I think we really need to be looking at organisations and not at individuals. And I think, uh, you know, probably for me on a personal level, as an autistic person, you know, I I think that you there's there's often a feeling that your behaviour is being judged or managed. You you know that, and I know I've been in many situations, you know, being an outspoken woman and an outspoken autistic woman, where you know that people are managing your behaviour. And, you know, frankly, it makes me angry and it upsets me. And I can't imagine how it must feel because I, I, I'm privileged and I don't live in the situation that many people are living in where they don't have control over their lives. But I can't imagine how it must feel for there to be a whole program around your behaviour. And starting with behaviour instead of starting with a person and their hopes and their dreams and what they want and finding a way through and, and starting with behaviour instead of saying, let's get to know someone and let's help them have relationships and connect with people and feel good about themselves. It just doesn't make any sense to me and that's why it's all going wrong. So, so I feel, you know, I, I know there, there are lots of decent organisations that that are doing it and 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 I think you know they some may do it well because they've got good support workers. I, I recently um I recently finished writing a book about organizations that do this successfully and the majority of the organizations that I talked to said um, they don't need to do it because they form relationships with people. So they one of them said um, even though they were told by commissioners they had to do it, they refused because they said we've been doing this for many, many years. There's no reason why would we introduce something that doesn't work and others saying it doesn't work. And, and then interestingly, others saying, well, we really train our staff in it because um, at the moment it's really hard to get high quality staff so we need to give them a lot of training so for us PBS is a really good way of training staff so so you know there's some different different views there but um, yeah I think so, so 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 it concerns me it really concerns me and I think my my feeling is that where organisations are really supporting people in a person-centred way and putting it under the umbrella of PBS, they really need to reflect on what it is that they're doing and are they really trying to change a person's behaviour fundamentally? Are you, are you trying to change the fact that somebody can't cope with noise and 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 putting them in situations which, which um, distress them and helping teach them to be less distressed about that? Is that what no, you're doing? Yeah, you know, that's such that's a big question. Point. You know, this is these are human rights. Absolutely, yeah, I'm so interested scary. in this. Year. I hadn't thought about it like that. What you're saying about organisations and that sort of conflict with being person-centred, because if you're trying to get somebody to adapt to a, an environment, if it's a congregate setting, you know, um, it, it's almost impossible. I think so. You so then therefore you would be using. Um, I mean, that's what happened to me. PBS was used to, to get me to fit 
um, with the setting and, and, and not act out. Yeah, no, I think as well, we, something Alicia talked, talked, touched on there was about it being required, being required by the CQC, being required by STOMP, being required by commissioners. So I think some providers certainly go, oh yeah, we need to do PBS. Okay, so what is PBS? Oh, it's this. And they put their own interpretation of what that is. And then you can drill that down. You'll have individual staff members supposedly working to the same programme and they're putting their own interpretation of what that is. On a day-to-day -day basis, what's happening sort of on the floor, if you like, is, is quite different from perhaps what PBS was envisaged to be, if it, if it was to do with being gent originally gentle teaching and so on. Yeah, there's people think, oh, we've got to do this, we've got to tick this box, so we'll do it like this. There's no I mean, regulation, there's no, is there? We saw the same thing in a way when when introducing person centred planning, so different organisations, so good organisations would do it well and, and organisations that didn't have that experience or culture or whatever set up um, didn't. And and in a way, um, but, but that that sort of comparison stops there, because if you don't do good person centred planning, there is less of an impact than a poor organisation doing positive behavioural support and traumatising people. So, so you know, I think that that this is this is a real a real question. And and I would say, you know, I I know sort of hand on heart that that there's some really good stuff going out on that out there under the name of positive behavioural support. And I would say to those people in the industry and you know colleagues at Build. And, and other values-based organisations to, to really reflect on what it is you're doing. Are you, are you trying to change somebody's behaviour? Fundamentally, is that what you're doing? Mm, thank you. I think, I think I've said in the past, you know, there's a lot I don't like about what my husband does. <laughs> I'm not going to draft a PBS plan for him. <laughs> we'll, we'll just work it out relationally. <laughs> And do you think that's the way forward, Julie? What you know, what what's neat? What does what does the PBS community, you know, it, need it does, to, to do? I guess it does need to see people as equals, doesn't it? It has to be. We, you know, that that just because somebody's doing something that somebody else disapproves of doesn't make the practitioner or the staff member or whoever superior in some way. We have to. We have to see people as equals. We have to understand that you can't trample all over somebody's human rights. And you have to work relationally with people, most definitely. I think it's interesting as well, because I've seen, um, I haven't read much about it, but I've seen this kind of notion that PBS doesn't work with autistic people, but it works with people with learning disabilities. And I think we really, really need to question that. So why, why is that? Is it because maybe someone with a learning disability won't speak out about it? Is that why or, you know, and, and, and I think that, you know, what I know, because I've done it and I've spent my career doing it, is that what works with people with learning disabilities who have developed behaviours for all sorts of reasons that are really difficult and make it hard for them to live in their communities is, is really good, gentle, creative support and, and getting to know them and surrounding them with people that care about them. And, and that, that's what changes stuff. And I think in doing that, Alicia, you, you decrease those those power dynamics that Julie was talking about in the first part, because I think one of the one of the issues is, is that, you know, inherent, you know, it doesn't matter how relational you try to be. If you're being looked after, those people are more powerful than you, you know, it, just just by the very nature of, of their role, you know, and their job, even if they're in your house supporting you. Um, and and also, you know, by the fact that they're working in a in a narrative of 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 science, you know, and behaviorism, um, which is essentially what PBS is based on. You know, there's a whole power um, effect um, by by that by that scientific narrative, and and I guess also by people's histories. You know, that that people have a label and that they've likely accrued a lot of um, relational trauma. And so the person subject to, to, to the support um, is going to be sensitive uh, to those power differentials. So it's so important for me, I think, that, that we really prioritise that relationship and acknowledge those power differentials and actively work to reduce those as much as possible, be as least domineering as possible. Mm -hmm. 
Mm, absolutely. I think that's, uh, you know, I've always felt that in sort of setting up housing and support arrangements for people and, you know, in people that have ended up in, in hospitals and subject to positive behavioural support and, and those kind of interventions. Um, in my experience, generally people who need to have more control over their lives and not less and that's what makes the difference is really giving people agency where we don't give people agency we're helping people to take their agency and have control over their lives and that's whether they speak it or whether they show it it doesn't matter whether you can say what you want or or not and I I think that that sort of almost feels like counter to PBS and I know that there's uh, you know I, I know that that there will be approaches that are about really doing that as well but that's not trying to change someone's behavior so I'll keep coming back to the same question what is it you're doing yeah it's all about trauma as well as Alexis said as well you know it's uh if somebody's accrued all this trauma throughout their lives you don't just give them some more trauma you you've mm -hmm. got to have some kind of trauma-based trauma-informed support in the mix as well and there has to be an acknowledgement for, for me from the community that so many autistic people and people with learning disabilities have been harmed by pbs and an interrogation into why that why that's happening why is it that the community you know the the activist community is so anti pbs why why is that the case you know because what i hear at, at build really conflicts with my own personal experience which was massively traumatic and that and that of my friends which again you know is is without without um exception has has all been traumatic and i think there needs to be some acknowledgement mm -hmm. of that and some interrogation of it definitely any other words of wisdom before we close Oh, well, I can just tell you to, to complete Jamie's story. He's now been living without PBS for a year now, and uh, he's very happy, <laughs> doing well, got a good life, has a great relationship with his carers, um, and um, he hasn't missed it. And, and I think that's the, the same for many people, that are uh, being supported well as well, is that they, they've somehow managed to to um, go back to an ordinary life um, in their communities, near their families without these kind of interventions. And so um, I think that is the, that's, that's why we really need to question, is it the right thing to be doing? I think that um, the CQC um, really need to be thinking about what it is they're doing if they're regulating for positive behavioural support that doesn't make any sense to me if we're, if we're talking about it might be a tiny percentage of people that would need sort of you know gentle teaching that positive support approaches creative support approaches why aren't they regulating for that you know it's a it's so um and 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 commissioners um really need to be thinking about more carefully about what they're doing because I think I think it's a it feels to me quite like quite a lazy approach the fact that it's kind of taken over as the the thing that you do to people and with people I'm sure many will say but it's to people and and um and and so it's um it, it, it needs it needs questioning we all need to do a bit of soul searching about it Thanks, Alicia. And I guess for me as well, it's about, you know, what's been the most reparative is where I've been genuinely given agency, as you were saying, you know, and it wasn't um, veiled with, well, this is good for you. You know, it was it was genuinely, you know, my opportunity to explore relationally with safe and supportive uh, people in a safe and supportive environment, you know, what would be what would be most helpful and and what works for, for myself. Um, and I, I'm not sure. Um, as you were saying earlier as well, you know, how that can happen in a congregate setting or where, you know, those powers um, are exerted no matter how well-meaning um, the team is. So I think, yeah, relational working and, and autonomy and agency are, are so important. Well, we're running out of time. So thank you so much um, for your time today. It's been, a, it's been a pleasure to talk to you about, about this subject.